I probably would have left it alone and carried on with my life without her, but it was his smirk that did it. He forced my hand with that smirk, and whether she saw it or not, their total disrespect tore into my soul. It was obvious that Samantha, my wife of six years, wouldn't be my wife for very much longer. Part of the problem in our marriage was that I had been working too hard for the past six months. I was in line for a big promotion, and with it would come a very large bump in salary. That meant Sam could quit her job, and we could start our family. Another problem was that Samantha is a beautiful woman, one of those drop-dead babes that never learn to be assertive when men flirt with her. She didn't exactly flirt back, but she has a wonderful smile that sends the wrong message. Since Sam bears a close resemblance to Scarlett Johansson, with the same beautiful face and great body, only taller, men naturally gravitate to her. I had my suspicions for a while. She was working too many late nights, and there was more travel out of town. But the smirk on his face at their company holiday party, that was the smoking gun. I almost had to force Sam to invite me to this party, and now I knew why. Respect is a big thing in my family. My name is John Simon Selly, by the way. If you'll indulge me for a few minutes, I'll give you just one example. Back in high school, I was the all-star shortstop for the varsity squad. It was early in the season, and we were facing the team that had the best chance at keeping us from a conference championship. The opposing pitcher threw a fastball right at my head. The ball missed my face but hit me in the helmet. I got up and started jogging to first. I looked over at the pitcher, and he gave me a smirk, then quietly mouthed, wimp. I charged the mound and surprised the heck out of him. Instead of playing patty cakes like most baseball fights, I whacked him with my fist right in the nose, breaking it and sending blood gushing all over his pretty white uniform. All hell broke loose after that. I was suspended, awaiting a hearing on whether I'd be permanently banned. My coach was fairly disgusted with me, but my old man agreed with me when he took me home. I saw what that jerk did and said to you, You can't let these clowns disrespect you. It all goes downhill after they know they have you by the balls. The coach's disapproval bothered me, though. He'd been my coach for the last three years, and I wanted his respect. When I showed up in his office the next day, he gave me a lecture I never forgot. What do you care what some lowlife says to you? You know where I grew up, down at State, and 75th, where some gangbanger was always trying to get me riled up. I was lucky, neither my mother nor father would tolerate any fighting. That kept me on the straight path to college and out of the slum. Now I live where I want, doing a job I love, and those stupid gangbangers are either dead, in jail, or living in a room with a needle in their arm. So here's the thing, if you get to play for me again, there will be no more fighting, no matter what the circumstance. I ended up serving a three-game suspension. Somebody was looking out for me, because, at the hearing, Ron Muller, the opposing cashier, showed up. It seems he was disgusted with the way in which his coach was trying to win. Their coach had ordered the pitcher to throw that fastball with the intent of getting me banned permanently. Ron didn't want to win the title that way and save my skin. Ron ended up being the catcher on my college team, and eventually the best man at my wedding to Sam. Back to the present. I could have handled it if Samantha had shown some respect, and just said, It's over, and I'm leaving. I've been dumped before, granted not since college, and not by a woman who stood before one hundred of our friends and family, vowing to love me forever. But I could have handled it, believe me, since Sam chose her path, obviously fooling around with her co-worker Ted Harris, and coming home to give me seconds, I found myself like one of those cartoon characters, my coach on one shoulder whispering in my left ear, take the high road, and walk away, my father on the other shoulder shouting in the right ear, crush them both. Son, it didn't take a long time or any secret spy tricks to get the concrete proof I needed. Monday morning after her company party, I took off work, hired a divorce lawyer, and retained a private detective. The first night that same week, when Sam called to tell me she was working late, I called the ex-police detective, 
and he followed them to the jerk's townhouse. No photos of them actually fooling around, but I'm certain they didn't spend two hours in his townhouse analyzing spreadsheets. Everything was ready for Sam's next visit to his place. Friday night she called to let me know she and a couple of the women from the office were having drinks and dinner. Don't wait up, John. It's been a while since I had a girl's night out. An hour after her call, I drove over to the address the detective had given me. And there was Sam's car parked in the drive. I knocked on the door and was surprised when he answered the door standing in his bathrobe with that same smirk. Don't get any ideas, John. I'm a black belt in Karat. I'm not here to start anything, Ted. She's yours now. And the last thing I need is a lying, cheating woman for a wife. Tell Sam to come to the door so I can deliver these papers. I showed him the Mandela envelope. Sam, come downstairs. No need to hide. Sam came down the stairs wearing a robe that matched the jerks. I almost smiled. Sam, here are the divorce papers. Get yourself a lawyer and have him or her contact mine to work out the settlement. Do not come home tonight or any time before tomorrow evening. By then, I'll have my stuff out of our apartment. And you can come back. Sam took the envelope as if it were radioactive. John, my folks and my brother's family were supposed to come for brunch tomorrow. What am I supposed to tell them? If I'm not there. Not a problem, Sam. Just before I came over here, I emailed your brother and gave him this address. I told him you and Ted would be hosting your family here instead of at our apartment. I'm assuming he'll get the message in time. If not, I'll let them know about the change in venue when they arrive tomorrow. Bye. I looked at Sam. She was starting to break down and cry. But then I saw it on her left hand and almost lost my cool. Sam, you didn't even have the decency to take off my grandmother's wedding ring when you fooled around with this bastard. Give it to me now. The ring you gave me is in the envelope with the divorce papers. Sam broke down completely, but did get the ring off her finger. I left without saying another word. I wasn't completely surprised when the doorbell rang Saturday morning at 11 a.m. Maybe her brother didn't get my email in time after all. This will be awkward, I thought when I looked out the window to see Sam's family on the porch. I didn't have a clue how awkward until I opened the door. John, we're sorry. I got your email, and I talked to Sam. Can we come in and talk? For the next hour, her brother, mother, and father did their best to convince me I should let Sam back home and drop the divorce. It seems Sam went to her brother's house after I left her and Ted, confessed everything, and asked for their help. Sam knew I loved her mom and dad, especially since my folks moved to the Sunshine State after my dad's retirement. The three of them talked about counseling, forgiveness, pity, etc. I spent the next full hour trying to convince them it wasn't going to happen. No one was happy, and there were no smiles when they left. It took every bit of my willpower to not hug my mother-in-law when she walked out onto the front porch. She was crying, and I wanted to tell her it was okay. But it wasn't, and I didn't give her that hug. We did the usual dance for the next few months until the divorce was final. She wanted to talk. I didn't. Her attorney asked for counseling. Mine said it would be a waste of time and money. The marriage was irrevocably broken by my wife's infidelity. The week before the divorce, I was invited over to Ron's house for dinner. He knew more of the messy details of why Sam, and I broke up than I did because his wife Gerald and Samantha still talked occasionally. I was sitting in his kitchen, watching his wife Jelly cook dinner. Jelly, that's what we all called her, was seven months pregnant, and she just glowed. Ron saw me staring at her tummy, and knew what I was thinking. John, let's go out on the porch and chat. I'll meet you out there. My beer's gone. I headed over to the fridge, and on the way out, put my arm around Jelly's waist. He adores you, Jelly. Don't ever cheat on him. Why would I do that, John? I love that man, and we're going to have a little boy soon. I'm not crazy. That's what I would have said about Samantha a year ago. Look at us now, six days from a divorce. Sam got stupid, John. I'm not near that dumb. 
Ron's not going to try to talk me out of this, is he? Go on out there and listen to what he has to say. I'll tell you what I tell Sam every time she calls. I'll support the two of you any way I can accept to give either of you my opinion on what you two should do. I gave Jelly a kiss on the cheek and went outside. I handed Ron one of the beers and waited. John, Sam wants to meet with you and talk before the divorce is final. She called me and asked me to ask you. No surprise there. I've given it some thought because this isn't the first time she's asked. Why should I give her the satisfaction of her contrition? All I will do is ease her mind, and I'm not going to give her that. I wouldn't either, John. But let me ask you, do you have any unresolved questions that she can answer for you? If so, turn this around on her. Get the answers to your questions first, then do whatever. Walk out, stay and listen. Whatever. What he said made sense. So you didn't get me out here to give her another chance. No, John. I only want what's best for you. If that's going through with the divorce, then I'm with you on it. I met Sam the night before our court date at a little cafe. We asked for a quiet corner table. Thanks for meeting with me, John. Sam looked like she was about to burst out in tears. It took every bit of my willpower not to take her small hands in mine. I didn't give her the chance to start the discussion. Sam, I know you have things you need or want to say to me, but first I have a couple of questions. The waiter chose that moment to take our drink orders and start the spiel about the chef's specials. I interrupted him as politely as I could, ordered a bottle of wine and the chef's salad to split, and asked the waiter to please give us as much privacy as possible. He understood. Sam, my first question is, why? I thought we had something special. We did, John, but the reasons for my actions are all old clichés. We'd been together and exclusive for seven years. I was seduced by a good-looking guy in the workplace who complimented me on anything and everything. You were spending more and more time thinking about or being at work. Not fair, Sam. You know I only put in the hours to get the promotion. You wanted to be a stay-at-home mom, and I was trying to make that possible. I know that, John. I knew it then, too. But at the time, I was being the selfish idiot, wanting it all. Right now, I can't believe I screwed it up so bad. We were less than a year from having our babies. I even had names. Tears were falling from her eyes, and I still resisted holding her hands. Okay, I promised myself I wouldn't ask, but I have to know. Was he that much better in bed than me? Sam surprised me. She started to laugh through her tears. No, no, no. He couldn't hold a candle to your lovemaking. I never had to fake it with you. Sam hadn't seen the waiter coming up behind her when she said this, and when he dropped off the wine, he took a moment to look at my lap and was smiling when he left. Sam turned beet red and we laughed together for the first time in six months. We finished our salads and the wine. Sam spent the time trying to get me to accept her apology, but I did hold out, telling her I might one day, but that it was too raw and too soon. When we got up to leave, Sam dropped the last bomb on me. This is another reason for my actions. John, you can be like a statue sometimes. Our marriage will end tomorrow, and you're like a statue. No tears, no shouting. I cry myself to sleep every night. Did you really love me? Sam, I love you more than you'll ever know. But first, let's get a couple of things straight. A few times tonight you referred to your actions. Let's call it what it was. You cheated on me, Sam. You fooled around with another man when you were supposed to be faithful, forsaking all others. Second, whether I go home tonight and get drunk or cry is my business. Chances are, after our divorce tomorrow, you and Jerkface will be a couple. He's already shown what he thinks of me by fooling around with my wife, ending my marriage, and laughing at me the whole time. If I cry right now, or if I told you about my bad nights, you're bound to tell him one day. Then that arrogant prick will have one more laugh at my expense. Don't push it, Sam. You don't want to see the demon that lurks just below the surface. I didn't go to court the next day. 
My attorney handled it. It was a modern, no-fault divorce with an equitable division of property. That day, the marriage just ended. Months passed since the divorce. I used the time to plan. I did get that promotion at work and the great bump in pay, but didn't have anyone or anything to spend it on. I probably spent too much time on Reddit after Ron told me about it over drinks one night. Ron gave me the lowdown on the r slash cheating underscore stories and said there were hundreds of stories in which the jilted husband got revenge on the ex and her lover. I read the stories, taking notes and ranking my favorite methods for revenge. Ideas that would land me in jail ranked pretty low. Psychological terror ranked pretty high. The rankings changed after I had the misfortune of bumping into Ted one afternoon. I didn't know it at the time, but following our divorce, Ted and Sam did start dating again and were now engaged. Ted let me know that he won. I lost. Sam was a fantastic lover that he couldn't get enough of, and I must have something wrong with my equipment since Sam was so easy to get into his bed when we were married. Was I a coward because I turned and walked away? I wasn't afraid of Mr. Black Belt, but I had just spent two years busting my butt to get that promotion, and any physical altercation would flush that half of my life down the drain. The guy had already messed up my love life. Would he get the satisfaction of wrecking my work life, too? I walked away. You may call me a doormat for that, but it is what it is. My method for payback came to me out of the blue. It's a funny thing about some guys— they can't help but dip their pen in the company inkwell. Ted was no exception. Sam wasn't the first woman he dated from their company. One day, I received a call from Helen Smith, a woman I had met at one of the company parties. She wanted to meet me for dinner. Her treat. Ted and Helen were getting serious, she thought, when suddenly he treated her like a disease. Ted dumped Helen when he decided to pursue my wife. Things heated back up between Ted and Helen, while Sam was fighting our divorce, but immediately turned frosty when the divorce went through and Ted and Sam became a couple again. Helen was pissed, and hell has no fury like a woman scorned. How could you let Ted steal your wife without so much as a whimper? I was at that holiday party last December and, and saw the way Ted acted. I was still in love with Ted, and was hoping you would fight for your wife. You didn't do a thing. Are you clueless or just a wimp? This dinner invitation was Helen's attempt at giving me some backbone. I sat back, took a drink of my wild turkey, and thought about how I would answer her challenge. Helen, sorry. I don't know you and don't know how much you can be trusted. Trust is in limited quantity at the moment. But I can tell you I am not a wimp, and that someday there will be repercussions. Ever hear the saying, Revenge is a dish best served cold. Helen looked at me. Damn, I didn't think. You're Sicilian. That's right. And if you're really interested in some revenge, then just sit tight for a while, and one day I'll call you and ask for a favor. Nothing illegal, but very important. I went home that night, and my ideas started to gel. But could I trust Helen to keep her mouth shut? I discreetly made an inquiry to someone I could trust, and he confirmed Helen's story. Helen and Ted had dated, and their breakup coincided with Sam and Ted's now open relationship. While we talked, my source apologized for having missed the first affair and not giving me a heads up. He graciously offered that the company's senior management was tired of the romantic trauma surrounding Ted's affairs, were in the process of rewriting the corporate policies regarding workplace romances, and that Ted was rumored to be skating on very thin ice. During my separation and the two months since the divorce, I'd been hiring an escort for my sexual and social release. Cindy Fox, her professional name I assume, and I would go to dinner or a show every two to three weeks and would end up in bed for a couple of hours of sex before she went home. It cost me a bundle, but like I said, I had nowhere else to spend my increased paycheck since my promotion. It was my first time paying for sex, at least directly, but I didn't want to tempt myself with a rebound relationship. So Cindy became my go-to lady whenever the urge hit me. She also became an integral part of my plans. I called Helen and told her if she was on board. She only had two tasks. 
First, give me Samantha's schedule for when she would be out of town on business. Second, at the right time, approach Ted and ask him to meet her in a public place to get closure. Helen called me the next day. Sam was scheduled to be out of town in two weeks for three days and nights. Helen contacted Ted and arranged to meet him the first night of Sam's trip at the downtown Hyatt Lounge, just for drinks and conversation. But I'm certain Ted was thinking he might end up with Helen one last time. Cindy was laughing when I explained the first part of my plan, but I really shocked her when I laid out part two. Cindy, do any of the ladies that do what you do ever get a social disease? I'm not talking about any deadly stuff like AIDS. I'm talking about the curable things like the clap. Sure, it happens, but it's rare. Most of the girls insist on condoms. There are a couple I know that will bear back, but they try to be careful, and they charge double for the privilege. There have been a couple of those girls that had to get the cure. Do me a favor, please. Let me know when one of the girls has something to contribute. I'll pay her the bareback rate, and I'll pay you the same as a finder's fee. You're kidding, right? You want to give this guy something. Nothing deadly, just something to spoil his wedding night. Everything was set for part one. Cindy told me the details later that night. She was sitting at the bar in the Hyatt Lounge, sipping a Cosmo when Ted walked in and sat next to her naturally. They exchanged smiles, and Ted ordered a scotch. Cindy was wearing a typical business suit and looked very professional, not that kind of pro. Ted's cell phone rang almost immediately. Sure, Helen. I understand. Hope your mom gets better. Ted hung up and immediately turned to Cindy. Hello, I just got stood up because my date's mom is sick. Can I buy you another? Cindy gave Ted a big smile. Sure. I can handle two, but don't try and get me drunk. I've been on the road for two weeks and haven't seen my husband during those two weeks. A girl starts to get randy. Cindy flashed the wedding band I bought in a pawn shop for this occasion. It was like waving a red cape at a bull. Ted took the bait. My name's Ted. It's a pleasure to meet you. They drank and small talked for a half hour. Cindy did have that third drink and did her best to act a little tipsy. Before she finished her third Cosmo, Ted was doing his best to seduce her. Little touches on her arm and leg. Charming conversation with enough sexual innuendo to try to warm her up. Cindy told me it was hard not to laugh at all the work he was putting into this, considering she was getting paid. She finally had enough of the seduction, finished the Cosmo, and invited him up to her room. Ted and Cindy fooled around twice up in her room. Of course, Ted didn't know that the entire event was being photographed. Cindy kicked him out, claiming a need to recover and get some sleep but not before getting his cell number. Then she and I reviewed the photos on my laptop. I promised any shots where she could be identified would be erased before either the camera or memory card left the room. Even after erasing half the photos, we still had a few dozen showing Ted in his altogether, fooling around with the stranger. It was another month before the wedding, and I was hoping we'd get lucky before the month was out. Within two weeks, Cindy called me with the news. One of the girls is sick with gonorrhea. I only found out because she's asking me and another girl to cover while she takes the cure. Did you tell her about my request? Briefly, she's willing to have a conversation, but be aware she's a mercenary and will probably charge you another double because she figures you'll have a hard time getting a replacement. What about your rate? Does that change? No, I figure we have a deal and you always take good care of me. Which is true, because I've always tipped her an extra C-note. So, Cindy and I met with this young lady, no name she insists, and worked out the details for part two. This will cost me a few Gs, but it is so worth it. Cindy calls Ted the next day. Hey, Ted dear, it's Cindy from the Hyatt. Remember me. How could I forget? Are you in town? Yes, I'd wondered if you're up for the ride of your lifetime. Pretty full of yourself. We had a lot of fun that night. But what are you willing to do to make it the ride of my lifetime? I'm here at the Hyatt with a co-worker. She's a wild one. And after what I told her, 
She thought you could handle us both this evening. Can you get away? Of course, Ted's self-image made him believe that two women would want to fool around with him. I just need to make a quick phone call, and I'll be in the lounge. Not the lounge. Just come up to room 449. We'll be here. Bring some stoli, chilled. When Ted arrived at room 449, our mystery girl was there, but no Cindy. Where's Cindy? Ted asked. Got a call from home. Her son is sick, and she's back in her room walking her husband through the routine. She said it's his first time dealing with a sick kid, but you and I can get started, and they did. Cindy never showed up, but our mystery girl did her best to make Ted forget about the threesome. After he left at ten, she met us at a local coffee shop and collected the balance I owed her. I admit I felt kind of guilty doing this to a guy, but he's such an ass that by the time he left, I almost felt good about it. She picked up the envelope and walked out the door. Cindy looked at me and shrugged. Told you she's a mercenary. You paid me for the night. Wanna go to your place and fool around? I did, and we did. I waited until the week after the wedding and finished my project. Both Sam and her company received envelopes in the mail with phony return addresses. Both envelopes contained a brief letter and a set of photos. Sam's letter read, Dear Mrs. Harris, Sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but it seems your husband and my wife have been seeing each other when she was traveling to your town. The P.I. hired to get me the proof provided me with these photos. I only included those that show his face, so you would have no doubt it's him. I wasn't going to inform you except I just received word from my doctor that she's infected me with a social disease. You may want to get tested. Signed, the soon-to-be ex-husband of your husband's whore. The letter to the CEO read, Dear Sir, Just thought you should know what kind of man your company employs. According to my wife, he picked her up at a bar, got her drunk, and proceeded to give her a social disease. Don't know if this letter will get to you or whether you care, but I'd watch the scumbag. He seems to have no morals. Signed, One Sorry Husband. Things quickly fell into place. Sam's family had the marriage annulled. Ted got fired, and rumor has it they both were on meds. It helps to have a friend in the county health service department. I pretty much went about the business of getting on with my life. Sometimes I imagine follow-up scenarios. In one scenario, I beat the living daylights out of Ted. In another, I pretend to get back with Sam, take her to a foreign country, then leave her stranded there without any cards, passport, etc. I might have done it too, except for the vision of her mother and what it would do to her. I may have been that cruel to my ex-wife, but not to my former mother-in-law's daughter. But I quickly lost interest as my new job became more interesting and challenging. That is until the next Simon Sully family picnic. Uncle Vin, my father's older brother, was there. Uncle Vin is connected, if you get my drift. He called me over, and we had a quiet chat. Johnny, tell me about your divorce. What happened? I liked that girl. I gave Uncle Vin the Reader's Digest version of our breakup. What did you do about it? Then I explained what I had done to seek revenge. That's wicked, but not exactly scorched earth. No, Uncle Vin, I did my best to put it behind me. Take the high road. I told him why. That's good, and those are great reasons. You know, that baseball coach really did you a good turn. Uncle Vin wasn't any more or less a bigot when it came to racial matters, but he always thought it was funny that a black man from the Chicago slums had as much influence on my life as my father. If you took after that hot-headed dad of yours, you wouldn't be the man you are today. Many times, I had to settle my baby brother down, or he would have wound up dead or in jail. You ever talk to Coach Price? Only a few times, and not since I was a junior in college, I kind of let it slip. You should look him up. He volunteers at the Boys and Girls Club down on West Palmer. Let him know what he's done for you. A man likes to hear that once in a while. But right now, walk over to your father, give him a hug, and tell him you love him. He needs to hear that too. 
Uncle Vin was a funny guy. I've heard that he's feared by many, but he always acted like a teddy bear around me. I did go to see Coach Price, and he convinced me to start volunteering at the club. I even started dating his niece, a beautiful woman. But that's another story. In other words, no drama, just love. One last thing. On my 30th birthday, I received a birthday card from Uncle Vin. It simply read, Happy Birthday, Nephew. Nobody laughs at a Simon Sully. It seems a certain Ted Harris was found last night in the alley behind the bar he frequents. He was the victim of a mugging. Nothing life-threatening, but he did have a broken nose, a few broken fingers and ribs, and two very swollen testicles. I guess his black belt must have been left at home that night. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.